This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description. A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Reverend Bill is a New Thought minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the New Thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is New Thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. And we're going to have another conversation about all things practical prayer, or spiritual, or whatever. 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 And today (laughs) you want to talk about relationships. I do. I do, because some things jumped out at me. Uh, We've been off for a week. It feels like a long, long time. So many things have happened uh, during the week. Uh, my granddaughter had her prom, and that was interesting because she went by herself, which is a um, a thing these days. It's a very modern a thing to do, yeah. Yes, it was really, really very interesting. And then she graduated from high school just this weekend. That's a busy and, week. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. I, I can tell you more, but I'll just <laughs> leave it at that. But uh, relationships jumped out at me because... I have a just an interesting family dynamic, mm-hmm. uh, and I've, it works out so beautifully because I don't pay any attention to the the um, the prescribed re- relationships. I guess uh, to to put it, I don't. You know, I really don't care. Like I am, I'm Gigi. You're Gigi, and I'm Gigi, and it's it was it started out being what my grandchildren called me and it turned into a nickname that everybody <laughs> calls me. So it's like everybody is one of Gigi's babies and or Gigi Boo Boo's I call <laughs> even the, <laughs> even even and it's funny because even the grown people that yeah. have become a part of the family through interesting ways um, I'll say, oh, there's Gigi Boo Boo so and so, and they just look at me like, she really just said that, right? She really just said that, and they instantly become very comfortable, and it made me think about um, just how relationships are orchestrated, and if you get out of the way and allow them to flow, it can just be a great thing, mm-hmm. you know. We we and and let me just call it a little bit differently. I mean, a little more clearly, we went out to dinner after the graduation and one person showed up that no one would have ever expected that person to show up. And Mm. they showed up alone. And we were like, I can't believe it's, we're waiting for the other person to, you know, (laughs) to come. And it was so incredibly deep because we felt like we created an atmosphere that this person felt safe and trusted himself to come and be a part of, of, you know, the, Mm -hmm. what is supposedly family. And we're looking at him thinking, Hey, we're glad you're here. Come on, sit down. And and I thought about how difficult that must've been and why should it be, you know, why, why should it be difficult we're just all people, you know what I mean? And well, yeah, and there's the assumptions, you know. That's Don Miguel Ruiz said, "Don't make assumptions." It's one of the four agreements. And when I make the assumption that that's your family, and I can define myself as being not your family, then when you get together for a family thing, that doesn't include me. And it's all just an assumption. It may or may not include you. So, and you brought up a, a, a great story. I actually was uh, this weekend at a memorial service for my sister-in-law's mom. And 
um, many, many years ago when I was in high school, uh, there was a girl who I was dating. I dated her for a while in high school and college. And she was an artist, and she's still an artist. And my dad had a degree in fine art and did a lot of painting uh, just as a hobby. He never wanted to do a show because I think he was afraid of spending a lot of money on frames and then not making the frame money back selling his artwork. So he had a whole lot of artwork. And when we had his memorial service, we gave paintings to the family members. We kind of divvied them up. So I have a bunch of them and my brothers have a bunch of them and there's cousins who have some of them. And we gave one to her. And she was just astounded. So, oh my God, hey, mm. that, that's so wonderful. It's like, well, yeah, you're part of the family and you have been since, you know, we were teenagers. So, and, and you'll appreciate this. So let's, you know, there's a connection there. Let's dive into the connection rather than say, this is the line of demarcation, your family, you're not. Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's so unfair. I mean, we are created by one God, you know, however mm -hmm. you want to look at that story, but it's only one God that created all of us. And I love the way you say it, that God is um, like manifesting through us yeah. in God's own particular way. And I may say it another way, you know, individual or unique uh, personalities. And so then we get a hold of it <laughs> and put labels on it and say, I can only relate to this person and this person and this person. And you know, aside from the fact that it just gets, and I'm the, we're not going to go off on this rabbit trail about being Christians, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but people will wear that label, say I'm a Christian, and then treat people in such an unchristian way, you know, because you aren't supposed to be here or you shouldn't be here or you, how do you get here? You know what I mean? I'm trying not to say a whole lot, but I'm saying a whole lot. No, I understand um, and and I think I think in many ways we've lost the lesson because Jesus, who we're all trying to emulate, was not Christian. He was Jewish, and he would hang around with the whores and the lepers, and the people who he was with said, "You can't hang around with them." And he's <laughs> this, this is, these are people. This is God's love unfolding as a whore and a leper. I'm going to go hang out with them, and yeah. you know, got into some controversy and some difficulty himself. But it wasn't because of him. It was because of the assumptions that the other people around him were making. Yeah. It, and when you leave all of those labels and rules and stuff behind, you get to see what a person really is. Uh, or everybody just, for, for instance, when the person came in to dinner and they sat down and everybody got over the shock, which was really trying to be cool about being shocked. And they sat down <laughs> and... <laughs> And I imagined how that person must have felt walking in the door and sat down. But in an instant, like there was a whole bunch of fries on the table. It was just massive food everywhere. And we were saying, here, take this, take this. And he was thinking like, I didn't order. Take this. And next thing you know, everybody was just key in. And it was, and I'm thinking, why did this have to be a big deal? Right. I mean, I understand it, but can we just flow in the beginning, so we don't have to worry about apologizing and make it just like, hey, have a seat. There's plenty of fries. <laughs> there you go. And if, you know, if there's, there's not there's, enough fries, we know where they're going to make some more. And, and came to a place a reason, where they got a, a fry making machine in the back. Exactly. And there's a reason for some how you got to be in this relationship with us. Whatever that relationship may be, we we meet at some kind of intersection in our yep. lives. You and I on a Facebook crazy, you know, you were doing a thing on Facebook. That was well, an I, intersection. I, that was the first ad I ever ran on Facebook. It was for a class that I was teaching and you contacted me and you never respond to Facebook ads and you weren't eligible no. for the class, but here we are <laughs> three, four <laughs> years later. Yeah. Something happened. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. eligible for the class. No, no I that was the know. practitioner class. But All right. You could take. We're doing it again in the fall. You're welcome to join us for that. I don't but, care how I got in. You know, I, I just no, you should, I you're, just you're, go. You're you're exceptional. You know who would have gotten in trouble for claiming to be a Christian? Who? Jesus. Well, yeah, because you, you know what the doggy head tilt is, right? No. Like if you if you're there with a dog and you make a high pitched noise and it turns its head to the and you know its ear goes up and like what what is that? 
if, if he had walked into a group of people and said, I'm a Christian, he would have gotten a doggy head tilt from everybody there. Christian, what's yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. What yeah. are you claiming? And there must be something wrong with you. And like, it's yes. become fashionable now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, what does this mean? You know, being a Christian, what does this mean? Is it, it's not a t-shirt or an arm band that we were wearing a while ago, what would Jesus do? And we got tons of those little slogans and stuff. But mm -hmm. in real life, how does this play out? And as a Christian, what does that mean in terms of how I respond to you and receive you and all of that? And I think we get too far away from how we're supposed to treat each other. Mm -hmm. I'm very big on that. I'm really, I'll just be honest. I'm really, really big on how people should in my, and I know you don't like shoulds, but in my opinion, should treat people. You, you know, it doesn't matter who the person is. Just stop all this crazy. Yeah. Uh, well, it has been observed on more than one occasion, including on this podcast, that there is one philosophical notion that is common to all of the world's religions. Mm -hmm. They all say it one way or another, and it's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or as you would have done, you know, that's, that's the way to act. Be, be that which you wish to say. I mean, it, it, every religion has a different way of saying it, different part of scripture, but we, it, it comes down to that's what it is. If you can and treat your neighbor the way that you want your neighbor to treat you, not the way that you're afraid they're going to treat you. <laughs> Preemptive <laughs> yeah, strike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do behave the way you wish to be treated. And that sets up the world that is not just Christian, but that is uh, the next level spirituality, if we can do it all the time. Well, I think we can, if we think about it. And you, you made me, you said something really significant and made me think of something else that uh, I read a lot of different religions. I try to understand as many, you know, whatever comes up, I go with it. And um, I remember way, 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 way back when Islam really got to be visible in our community mm -hmm. and they have a Quran, you know, and the Christian church would say, you're not allowed to, you don't know, read the Quran because that's wrong. And so you didn't do it. And then I started thinking, well, exactly why is that? that I'm not supposed to read this book? Like, am I, is something going to happen to me? And that was the idea. So, <laughs> yeah, so, something might happen to you. You might, so, you might believe some of it and or you agree might with find some of it. That, then yes, what do we do? And, and you find it may not be as different as you think. So fast forward, you know, I read Rumi and I started study Rumi and he was a Sufi um, Muslim and I started reading about Sufism. And I thought, you know what? People are missing out on a whole lot by not just flowing. It, you know, take all these labels. It's not the label. I think the label's okay, and it's okay for people to identify however they want to. It's to me, it's like, but don't be mean and judgmental about it. Like if they have a little bit of a different spin on it, that's okay, right? I think it's okay, and especially when I started understanding Rumi's poetry. I thought the world just misses out on so much beauty mm -hmm. because they got all these rules. Yeah. And if the rule is this is a family event and it's only for family and then somebody who can come and bring joy and love and entertainment and glee to the situation, think I have to stay away because of X, Y, or Z. We've missed the point. Yeah. We have missed the point. We have lost the opportunity for love to continue unfolding. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you were talking about there, I, you know, the, the, the groups that we're in, uh, it's, it's something else that has very much come to the forefront is the notion of othering. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm a Christian and that's great. And if I'm doing what Jesus said, I'm open to everybody, welcome in, you know, I'm here to love you, the whores, le <laughs> lepers, and other Christians. And if we look at everybody who's not just like we are and say they're the other, then we set up separation and then we get into competition and we get into if they have something, then that might, means I might not have it. And if I want something, then I can take it from them because they're not one of me and, you know, game on. And guess what? God is just booted out of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just, this has nothing to do with God because we now know what is 
right and those people are not right and we've got it and just it, and and can you believe that people go through their whole life that way and think of the relationships that you miss and the wonderful moments that you miss by othering yeah and that is something that we are free to do that's the important part is that we're, we don't get punished and God is not going to smite us for doing that because the first two steps of a practical prayer, first step is recognition. God is all there is. There is only God. Everything is God's divine presence expressed in its own particular way. And that everything includes me and you and everybody else and every other everybody else. It is, it is all. We are all individualizations of God's love. So God knows <laughs> that God is one. And the only way that God can have the experience of othering, of looking down on someone else, is to do it through one of us. Gets to be the individual that is me, the divine presence of God with the perspective that I have. And if I can come up with that other thing, it's like, oh, well, there's something that's interesting, but it's not because it's God. It's because we're doing that and we're free to, to, to have that experience and we're free not to. And it can be, and I'm going back to the dinner after thing I was talking about. There was one person that could have shown up that would have made that thing totally different. Mm -hmm. Just through ice cubes <laughs> <laughs> and ice water on the whole thing. It would have just been totally different. And they didn't show up. You know, they and intentionally they, not show up or they they stuck in a traffic circle or something. No, over something, New Jersey getting in jug handles. <laughs> no, they they <laughs> left early. You know, they I the event after was open to everybody, anybody, but it wasn't like invitation. It was just, you know, this is it. And We're whoever shows up. Going by. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And that person left. Uh and I thought, hmm. And they were a key person, by the way. They, <laughs> I thought this whole thing would have not happened this way if that one personality had walked in the door. Sweet personality, don't get me wrong. But the way it happened, it was supposed to happen. Yep. Just the way it happened. Yeah. And yeah. And so, I love when that happens and that gets right back to, we've been talking about being in the flow a lot lately. And it's the same thing. If you tried to maneuver that person out of the room, it never would have worked. It never would have worked, but you let go and you say, this is all perfect. And the people who show up are great, have some French fries. And suddenly that person has another engagement. Oh, sorry, I have to leave. Oh, okay, bye. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it just works. <laughs> Let's take a break and continue talking about relationships. Is Reverend Bill letting you know that the Practical Prayer for Real Results class is now available on demand. That's right. You can take it at your own pace anytime you want. All of the information is at bethelight.com. That's b-the-light.com. You know where to find that stuff. The class is five lessons broken down into 18 modules, and you can take them at whatever pace is comfortable for you. As you work through the process, it starts out with the theory, goes into the practice. There are experiential activities and exercises. And at the end of the program, you will wind up with an understanding of how practical prayer works and a practical prayer for yourself that will work to create transformation in your life. And as you know, it works for everything. Take a look at the class online at bethelight.com. There's a sample lesson so you can see how the class is going to work for you and then dive in. The great news is it's on sale now. You can register and save $20 off of the regular price. I'm looking forward to seeing you in class. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We are talking about, about relationships. relationships today. Relationships, yeah. which is me and thee as individual expressions of the divine in relationship with each other. So God divvies itself up into all of these different things and then gets to experience what it's like to experience one of these things from the perspective of another. That's... Um... I want to say it's kind of a, a, a higher level of thinking when you say the second part, okay? Mm -hmm. 
because I'll say namaste, that has become a habit of mine. And it's because it's I see the God in you. And I want to remind myself it's natural now. And I just think that way. But I think it's just a really sweet thing to recognize the God in someone else. Yeah. And but you take it, you know, you take us to the higher level of saying that it's God individuating God's self to see how it feels or whatever to be this, this, and this, and to relate with. And I love that, but could we just see God in each other? Let's just get started. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We can keep the training wheels on for a while. We haven't got this yet. Yeah, because it, it, you got to get that part straight and that erases so much. Do you know what I mean? It just dissolves so many, um, Things that differentiate each other and one up each other. If you say, I see the God in you, well, what does that mean? Well, I remember I was always, I would always look at somebody and see something beautiful about them. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there was a young man in high school, was a really good friend of mine for since fourth grade. And, you know, people said he wasn't particularly attractive. It didn't matter to me. He was my friend. But I thought he had the most beautiful mustache I'd ever seen. You know, it was just, it was just such a perfect mustache and beautiful eyelashes. And I would look at people and I noticed things like that. And other people might see something entirely different. Like, there's something beautiful about everybody. Mm-hmm. Maybe you have to think of it that way, but I'm going to notice it, really. I'm, I'm just going to. And so my girlfriend says, you know, back then, says, listen, she thinks everybody's good looking. Don't ask her. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask her opinion. She thinks everybody's good looking. And I'm like, oh, okay. Never thought of it that way, but yeah. Isn't it wonderful so to be able see, to see the beauty all around you? It's peaceful. It makes and it's for, fun. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's fun. You don't have it's, to spend all that time judging. Well, this isn't this isn't pretty. This isn't nice. This isn't good. This isn't uplifting, and be all judgy. You get to like oh, that. Well, okay, this is beautiful like, in a different way. I like that. Be all judgy. I, it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's just nice because sometimes at the end of the day, I'll I'll think about something that I saw that was nice, and I mean it's just a nice way to end your day. Or, or go through the day. I mean, I got issues like everybody else. Trust me. <laughs> you know, I got things. <laughs> I have things in my world that I might wish were not there. But in balance, you know, I, I have a choice. And I'm glad I'm in the habit of choosing nice things. It, it makes it easier. Yeah. And, yeah. And what you're reminding me of now is um, speed bumps. So this is the section in uh, in West Philadelphia where they put speed bumps on the road. And it's really kind of annoying, you know, because you used to be able to just drive down the street. Now you have to drive down the street and slow down because they're, they're, they're not the little ba-boom kind of speed bumps. They're the kind that will actually launch a car into the air if you go over them too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's possible to drive down that street and on the one hand be annoyed because you have to do that, slow down, drive over to the speed bump, speed up, drive over and slow down again, all the rest of that. And at the same time, it's possible to say, there must have been so many people racing down the street, endangering pedestrians, crashing into each other, causing havoc and uh, bringing misery and pain and discomfort and death into people's experience, that these are a really good solution. Am I willing mm-hmm. to do my part and slow down to go over the speed bump? Because that means everybody else has to as well. So I can't look at them and say they're bad. I can't look at them and say they're good. <laughs> look at them and say they're necessary. <laughs> they're, they're, they're part of experience now. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just live with it, which is another thing that I thought about. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about a situation that was particularly unpleasant. And then all of a sudden it was gone. Now, it wasn't no all of a sudden. <laughs> it hung around for a bit. Mm-hmm. But when I look back, I'm thinking it just suddenly, quick just was, okay, it was there and now it's not. And now I'm not there. And so I look back and think, eh, that wasn't cool. I don't know the minute that it changed. Right. It just 
it just changed. When it was going on, it was all up in your face and you certainly knew that it was there. And when it stopped being there, you didn't notice. And then you thought about it and you said, well, where's that horrible thing? Oh, I don't have it anymore. I don't have it anymore. And I caught myself thinking, what do I have to do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Well, maybe there's a little (laughs) bit of that too. (laughs) But I'm I'm thinking about how many... uh, Things we try to orchestrate, including relationships that would happen just really nicely if we didn't put a whole lot of layers and, um, you know, definitions and bullet points under that. Yep. Just, you know, people are, can be pretty cool if they're, if they're comfortable, if you make them comfortable enough, they, they can be really, really nice. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up two uh old sayings, which I think are very valuable. And the first one is about relationships, which is that people come into our lives, we have relationships that are going to be for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And reason is there's something for us to do, something for us to learn, some inflection point in our life. And once that relationship with this new person has made that change happen, then they can go away. Uh, We don't need them anymore because we're transformed. Uh, a season. Somebody comes in and we're together with them. We spend a lot of time and we're commingling our ideas and our uh, our group consciousness. And then the season ends and they go away. And we are seasoned differently. So it's not that one thing that was a transformation, but now it's maybe a different perspective that we have. And lifetime are the people who show up and either stick around or keep coming back. <laughs> and, they're, and they're around for life. You know what? Now you're going to make me look at certain people and think, okay, you here for a season? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you must be one of those seasonal things. I can handle this. If you think they're there for a season and then they come back and it's like an every, an every summer kind of seasonal thing, then it's not a season. <laughs> it's a lifetime. <laughs> and, <laughs> And the other thing that, that 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 brings to mind is the story of the, uh, I don't think it was the emperor, uh, who assigned one of his smart guys to come up with a saying that would apply in all circumstances, some philosophical perspective that the emperor could have. And what the guy came up with was, this too shall pass. Mm. And what that means is whatever it is that's going on, eventually it'll not be going on or it'll be going on differently enough that whatever's got our attention hooked right now will be different. This too shall pass. And that applies Mm -hmm. to the good stuff as well as the bad stuff. You know, when I'm having a really great run and everything is perfect to remind myself, this too shall pass to not make the assumption that I've got it made. This is going to be the rest of my life. This is an experience I'm having now and I get to savor it and enjoy it Mm -hmm. and cultivate it and nurture it and, and be in it. Because it's going to change into something different, you know, even if, you know, <laughs> I did a wedding uh, for a couple that met at their junior prom. Uh, and they will eventually be old people who met at their junior mm. prom. And they may stay together for 70 years, but <laughs> youth, <laughs> youth and inexperience will pass, you know, the the, 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 the 2007 car they're driving, that will pass. There's a lot of stuff that will pass. There's a lot of stuff that's going to change and go away and make room for something new. And that newness is going to pass as well. The challenge has passed. The good things pass. It's, and the difference between a challenge and something good is the way that we judge it. And that helps us to center ourselves and, you know, kind of adjust our mindset that this is not going to be here no matter how much you love it. You know, I mean, I, when I met you, I used to talk about my car. It's a 2012 Nissan and it is adorable. And I've taken such good care of her. Oh my gosh. She's, and the color, is, they just don't make that color anymore. It's really very beautiful. And people think that she's very, you know, she's very brand new. Uh, but she is 2012. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I was feeling a little some kind of way about it. And I thought, you know what? You don't own anything. I mean, you know, of course I have the title, but Mm -hmm. you really don't own anything because the weather and all of that is going to take it away. You know, she's no matter what I do, no matter how I take care of her, 
eventually the weather. So, yeah, so or what something about? you live near the beach, so that's you know, certainly a possibility. <laughs> yeah, and even if it doesn't, he, even with all of that meticulous stuff, there are cars that have been around for a long, long time. And what's changed is they now have a, an antique car license plate. Yeah, you know, if, and, and, and the observation isn't what a nice car is. Wow, what a classic! How amazing that that car still drives. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's it's energy. It makes me think about, you know, what kind of energy do I really want to put in this? What does Mar- her name is Marley? What does Marley really represent? Marley represents a wonderful experience that I had getting her and yeah. so forth. But that's not the whole of my life experience every day. It's just a moment. And, mm-hmm. and I was, you know, I came to uh, to that intersection at one point. So I'm, I want to go back to relationship just real quick. Okay. Um, if we didn't put the labels on the relationship, like the year the car was manufactured and the, you know, the, what kind of car it is should perform this way. I'm thinking about the person that came to dinner. If you strip the label, if you kept the label, everybody would stand back. Mm-hmm. But if you looked, you took away the label and looked at what the person brought to the experience and has brought for so many years, it was a whole different, whole different thing. Yep. Just amazingly different. And you think, well, why do we bother about all that other stuff? You know, this is a really great person that has proven themselves without even trying to be a phenomenal person at every, every intersection and yet, if you look at the label of who they're supposed to be, then you stand back. And <laughs> they're supposed to be. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, they're supposed to be. You, you know, you actually. But I'm so happy that the circumstance happened because it just reinforced my own belief that you take the labels off and just see the persons for who they are and appreciate what they bring to the experience and if they if it's not a cool thing well just remove yourself and them but i don't want to miss out on nice experiences you know yeah yeah absolutely and that's 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 the wonderful part about being open to something wonderful happening uh that when it happens we can enjoy it and be in the moment understanding that it's going to pass and when we're dealing with something that is tedious and annoying and uncomfortable we can also remind ourselves that this too shall pass and be present through it and then when the enjoyable moments start up again go with those and and those sorts of things are always possible let's take another break and then we're going to do a, a practical prayer on this too shall pass Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy to understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b the light Dot com. That's b the lightcom Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We have been talking about relationships and relationships for a reason or a season or a lifetime and relationships where we can be in judgment or fear or and for that matter infatuation get into a relationship and we just get so overwhelmed by the idea that we're in a relationship that we completely lose track of who we are and whether that relationship is any good for us mm. <laughs> that ever happened <laughs> 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 
that <laughs> that's another four or five episodes. <laughs> then we'll gloss right over that one, just for now. <clears throat> and one of the things that we were talking about is uh, the notion that this too shall pass. And that's a wonderful topic for a practical prayer. This too shall pass. Because it means that whatever the experience is that we're having now, if it's something that we like, we can remind ourselves to be in the moment because there is the opportunity for joy and for prosperity and for health and vitality and comfort and whatever it is we're describing as good. And the knowledge that it's not necessarily going to last forever which makes us more grateful for the good that's at hand now and more intentional about that next experience we're going to be having. Because if I'm feeling strong and fit, and I know that this is going to pass, I might be even stronger and fit and comfortable in a different way. But the experience that I had been having gets to change. And when we recognize that this too shall pass, it lets us be focused on the experience we're having and the experience that we're desiring and being present as we go through that transition. It's also wonderful because if we're facing a challenging situation, if things, and I will use the spiritual term sucketh, if things in our experience <laughs> sucketh, then we know that this too shall pass and there is something better poised and ready to come into our experience. So that's the prayer. So let's turn our attention away from the details and the specifics, the stuff in the world around us. It's all still there. Everything that has happened up until now has happened. Everything that is in the process of unfolding now is already in the process of unfolding. And there's also newness at hand. There is an infinite creative power, one divine presence, one love, one source, one power, one infinite intelligence. We call it God or nature or spirit or the divine or the creator or the Big Bang or whatever it is that is the source from which everything flows, that one has been sharing and unfolding and revealing itself as all of its creation since the very beginning of time. And it continues to do so. And that creation, as we can note, includes each of us. We are each expressions of that infinite creative power. There's no possibility we came from something else. It's not possible that everything is that one divine power and presence except us. It's not like God's divine energy is the entire universe everywhere except me and the three feet around me. All of the good that is available everywhere is available anywhere. It's available right here and now, and it is showing up as and through and in each one who is within the sound of my voice. Divine and perfect expressions of that infinite love. So all of the experiences we're having are the opportunity for love to unfold in a new and novel and wonderful way continuing to unfold. It doesn't go for a while and then stop. It continues to unfold. So whatever it is that's happening now, this too shall pass. When we're experiencing something challenging or difficult or limiting, we can know that that divine power and presence, that love is continuing to unfold and this too shall pass. There is an experience, there is an opportunity, there is a next step which is greater and sweeter and richer and more uplifting and more harmonious and more prosperous and more comfortable, and more joyous and more creative than anything that we're experiencing now. And if we're feeling something wonderful right now, we are rejoicing. I'm claiming that we are rejoicing in the good of the experience, of the connection, of the uplift, of the love, of the harmony that we're experiencing, knowing that this too shall pass that we're involved in an ongoing process, an ongoing creative process that is creating new and fresh in every moment. And so I set the intention on behalf of each one who's listening to this prayer, that that good is unfolding in a wonderful, joyous, and uplifting way, passing from the experience that has been into this next experience in a way that brings uplift and what we describe as good into our lives. And I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for the good. I'm grateful for the awareness of the creative process. And I'm grateful to be able to speak this word and release it into that creative law, the same one that always says yes. And I'm grateful to know that once again is saying yes. That's what it does. That's what it's doing. The yes is underway. And so it is.
Practical Prayer Podcast with Rev. Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Rev. Bill's classes in practical spirituality at newthoughtphilly.org. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description.